is the next big thing. And as, as proof of this, just before I got here, I noticed uh, my tweet had been favorited. Uh, I was at just in Andrew's talk about the Redis foreign data wrapper, and hipster hacker uh, just retweeted my tweet about how exciting the new foreign data wrapper is. So you know, you, you know Postgres has gotten a lot cooler when. Uh, let, let's just hope we're not the, the PABS blue ribbon of databases. All right, so how Postgres got its groove back. I am uh, Peter Van Hardenberg. I work on Heroku Postgres. We run Postgres for the internet. Um, I've been doing this for a few years. Uh, I work at Heroku. We are a cloud application delivery platform. Um, our mission is to help people deliver better software faster. Uh, and that's why we offer Postgres. Postgres is the best database there is out there to offer, and uh, people love it. Um, we're very happy with Postgres. We run 500,000 or something. I, it gets harder to count as you get bigger. Anyway, uh, here's a little forecast of what we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to go through uh, the last 15 years of Postgres development in about 15 minutes, uh, dumbing it down to the utmost extent. Uh, then I am going to uh, talk a little bit about marketing for open source. Then we're going to talk about pain points and existential threats and what I think those mean and what the difference is. And then I'm going to talk about some ways that you can help Postgres to have its groove back and to uh, you know, continue to grow and be successful in the future. <coughs> so this is my uh, very own personal selective history of Postgres. I've mined the release notes all the way back to the beginning of the 7 series. Uh, and hopefully this will be a nice walk down memory lane for some of you. And for those of you who are relatively new to the community, I hope that uh, this will kind of help to explain how Postgres got to be the way it is. So let's begin with 7.0. Uh, this is 2000. Uh, the the 7.0 release uh, was the first time that foreign keys were implemented, uh, and it was the it saw the introduction of the SQL join syntax. So for each release, I've picked out a few sort of larger, high-level features, I've tended to not include performance, because every release includes a ton of performance work, uh, though to varying degrees. But uh, I'm just calling out kind of things that a user might notice or new capabilities in each one. So uh, these are very early days. Uh, Postgres has been around five years since uh, the shift from Quell to PostgreSQL, uh, when it grew the SQL query language. And it's really still immature. Uh, the following year introduces Toast, um, which, if Yan is in the audience, is uh, the best thing since sliced bread, uh, as it says in the manual. And Toast is actually a really innovative feature, which hopefully none of you have ever had to think about. Uh, because what it does is it invisibly and transparently moves large data out of the row and stores it elsewhere in a compressed form. And this is really awesome, because it allows Postgres to be able to ingest larger data sets than it was previously capable of. Just to give a sense of kind of how young the database is at this point, outer joins are not implemented until the next year. Uh, this also sees the introduction of the write-ahead log, which is such a foundational technology that it kind of blew me away that it hadn't been there since day one. Uh, in 2002, Postgres gained useful back vacuum. Uh, before 2002, vacuuming a table meant taking a full table lock on it and rewriting it. This uh, made it not very operationally convenient. Um, the transaction wall was removed. Uh, previously, every select statement you ran created a transaction. And beyond that, once you hit 4 billion transactions, uh, you were done. There was no way to go on. Uh, so I imagine 7.2 was a big relief to whoever it was that learned that the hard way. <laughs> I wasn't here for that uh, part of the story, but uh, I'm sure there was some great mailing list traffic on that. Uh, it also saw the introduction of statistics. It's, it's really remarkable looking back over these release notes, you know, just how basic the database was in those days when you compare it to the power and flexibility it has today. You know, this is the beginning of internationalization. It's still very, very early. 7.3 introduces schemas, a nice little cherry-picked one here. The ability to remove a column from a table. If you're using Postgres in 2001, you couldn't do that. Uh, prepared queries and dependency tracking. So the you know, ability to say, drop table cascade, or <laughs> maybe even more usefully, the ability to say, drop table and be warned that you really shouldn't. <laughs> this is all amazing stuff. 
Seven four is the end of the seven series. It introduces a regular expression rewrite. Of course, there's tons of performance work in all of these, and I think when you see a lighter release, just assume that's because most of the work was improving and polishing and and so on. Uh, but I wanted to call this out. It was in 2003 that Auto Vacuum began uh, to really be a part of the project. I think this is when it landed in Contrib. Uh, so to sum up the seven series, this was a period of about four years, and the focus was really on removing limitations like not being able to vacuum away bloat, not being able to go past four billion transactions, not being able to do this, not being able to do that, and also really just filling in the basics. Now, at this point, Postgres is now a relatively competent, if less performant, kind of MySQL alternative, I would say. You know, it's kind of a comparable level of completeness. Uh, so we'll move on to the eight series. 2005, uh, Postgres gets Windows support. It, it's really remarkable to me. I, I know I keep saying this, but you just learn to take these things for granted. Point in time recovery is introduced in, in 8.0. Um, this is quite a big deal if you have some kind of a problem and want to go back in time. Table spaces is a major sort of system administration requirement for a lot of use cases. Uh, 8.1 introduces roles. Uh, prior to that, there was users and groups and permissions, but they were sort of a Postgres uh, a special thing. This introduces most of the SQL role standard. Uh, tons of performance work. It's not until three years later now that AutoVacuum actually makes it into the core, uh, and it's still not on by default. For those of you who are waiting for things like logical replication, it really helps, I think, to look at this as an illustrative example of how the Postgres community marches sort of inexorably but occasionally very slowly towards awesomeness. <laughs> 8.2 introduces concurrent indexing. Uh, again, that's kind of a nice thing. You don't have to lock the table out. Um, it introduces new array functionality. And, and I really want to kind of call attention to uh, this moment here in 07, because this actually sees uh, HStore and PG Crypto land in Contrib as well. And that's kind of a big deal because this is the first time in the release notes going back that I see people begin to really take advantage of uh, kind of data types and extensibility of Postgres in a big way. Uh, by this point, sort of running in parallel, PostGIS is out there and it's around. But to me, uh, the introduction of these things into Contrib is sort of a sign that Postgres is beginning to take this concept of being the extensible database in a, a much more serious way. Uh, 8.3 then follows up with a, a trio of other similar features. Uh, full text search replaces T-Search 2 and lands in, in core, becoming part of core Postgres. Uh, the XML data type is introduced, and we've been fixing the security holes in libxml2 ever since. <laughs> And uh, the UUID OSSP library provides UUID functionality, which, by the way, these are all uh, grossly underappreciated features. But it's not until here, 2008, it was, what did I say? 03 that AutoVacuum you know, had its first Postgres release. And it's not until 08 that it lands, or 06 that it lands. And it's not until 08 that it becomes on by default. So. Um, Congratulations to all of you who worked on that, uh, and my condolences for the long slog. Uh, 09, this is actually where I, uh, I, I used Postgres a bunch back in the, the early 2000s, but this is where I sort of uh, start to really pay more attention and join the community uh, to some extent. So I'm, I'm a little less fuzzy on the details of some of these things. 8.4 brings in windowing functions, which if you, uh, my, I saw in the release notes for 9.3 have better documentation now which is good because this is an incredible, incredible feature, uh, which if you haven't figured out yet, it's not surprising because the documentation was really difficult to digest. But once you get used to using it, it's sort of a life changer. Uh, CTEs or with statements land in 8.4. Uh, warm standby, that's, that's the ability to have a Postgres running, receiving wall logs, and waiting in case of an emergency uh, becomes possible. And it also introduces, I think, the first real uh, push towards improving visibility into Postgres performance, which is still an area where there's a lot of room for improvement because the PG stat statements and the auto explain features land. Now, again, I, I think uh, we can sum up the 8 series by talking about advanced SQL and new data types, but I also think there's an increased focus on operability and transparency 
that sort of epitomizes this set of releases. And this is a really big thing. Uh, you know, this is, this is Postgres kind of starting to reach maturity, I feel, and go, you know, at, at the end of the 8th series, what we really see, I think, is a database that is, you know, competitive with many other offerings in terms of capability, but also beginning to explore where it can go and chart out its own unique and distinct identity. And of course, that leads into where we are today, which is the 9 series. And the 9 series introduces hot standby, which is, uh, if you're not using it today, basically a very important feature since it lets you run a uh, read replica and route traffic to it. This gives you all kinds of desirable capabilities above and beyond just failover. It also lets you isolate analytics. It lets you, uh, we have at Heroku many customers who run a, a relatively small database as their primary just to take writes to it and then have several read replicas that they distribute traffic across so that their analytics guys can have you know, a playground which won't affect the production site, and the production site uh, never slows down writes and can scale up and down as it needs on the, the read replicas. This is, this is a really big deal. And prior to 9.0, one of the most common complaints about Postgres that you heard from MySQL users was, aside from it's slow, it was also it doesn't really have replication. And no offense again to those who built things like Lundeast and Sloney, uh, those were not in core and therefore uh, difficult to approach. Uh, it also sees the introduction of PG Upgrade, which I know scares a lot of people. Uh, but PG Upgrade, I think, is a real game changer because it means if you have a large database, you now have a path forward that doesn't involve you know, 24 or 48 hours of downtime to dump and restore your database or uh, you know, worse, a you know, multi-week, multi-month engineering project to set up some kind of AirSats replication scheme to get you over. So this is, this is a really big release, I think, in terms of making Postgres truly competitive. And I think that's why the 9.0 label is, is really a great thing here. I think I was told that it was actually hot standby was such a big deal that that was why it got the 9.0 label. Uh, this is actually when Sun acquires, sorry, Oracle acquires Sun. Acquired by. Okay, good. I did do that right. Uh, and, and I think in the community, among some audiences, there's a feeling that a big part of Postgres's success comes from uh, MySQL's decline. And I, I agree that there's a component of that. You know, a, a, weak, a weak competitor creates opportunity. But I don't think that that's actually a fair assessment of why Postgres is doing well. You know, I think the, the real changes are already well underway. The big, the big motion forward to being this amazing database that we have now is already clearly sort of staked out in community progress here. And I think that the sort of MySQL acquisition and you know, I, having Sun acquired by Oracle meant that MySQL would never really be allowed to become a competitive database with you know, the, the big contenders. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Postgres wasn't already on a path to greatness before then. I think this just helped accelerate that. So 9.1 introduces sync rep. The synchronous replication support in Postgres now is unparalleled by any database in the world. You can control it per transaction. There's all kinds of different durability guarantees that you can choose. This is unlike anything else to stand up Oracle. You need to have like some crazy enterprise license and sync rep your entire database back and forth. It's a major affair. I set up sync rep on a cluster not too long ago. It was like two lines in a config file and a reboot or a restart. It's not a big deal. Uh, and that's really great. And again, 9.1 is the beginning of uh, foreign, foreign data wrappers and foreign tables in a read-only form. And this is a theme throughout Postgres, which is that uh, Localization, you know, I've called out per column collation support here. Uh, a previous release introduced per database collation support, and a previous release before that introduced per cluster collation support. So you kind of see this march towards ever greater generality throughout all the projects. And foreign tables is on that now. 9.3 introduces writable foreign tables, and that's, you know, the, the sort of culmination of this project, I think. It's also the first release that introduces extensions, which I think are uh, Postgres's secret weapon in the days to come. Um, we'll talk a little more about that. 
Uh, 9.2, we've got index-only scans, cascading replication, right? It's still improving. We also picked up range types, which was a, a really amazing new contribution that no other database could really do, because it's a composite type that envelops another type, and it so simplifies the work that you can do, and it integrates into the advanced indexing systems that Postgres has in a way that is really unique and not conceivable for other databases to implement. And it was the, the nature of Postgres's community and code base was such that although many people contributed to this patch, it's this focus on composability of the components of Postgres that really made this possible. You know, prior to range types, there were um, time, time intervals. Jeff, are you, what was the term for the thing before? Right, temporal or period. So the, the range types are a generalization of this, basically, which says, like, well, you can have a range of anything. And with the exclusion constraints, was, which were in 9.2 as well, or is that 9.3? 9.1? 9.1. 9.1. 9.1. 9.1. With exclusion constraints, which I edited out, uh, you can actually create, like, a really powerful and flexible scheduling system. Uh, but you also have all these other really cool use cases that you can fill. And you can do this. Uh, in a way that takes advantage of all this great index stuff. We also see the beginning of JSON data in 9.2. 9.3 introduces JSON manipulation functions. Uh, if you go to uh, Oleg and Theodore's talk, or I'm not sure who's presenting there, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a bunch of new exciting work that is leading towards you know, ever greater power in that space as well uh, down the pipeline. 9.3, of course, if you made it to uh, the talk on new 9.3 features, which I think was Rob Treat. We've got materialized views, kind of. Uh, again, this is the, sort of the theme, which is that materialized views have landed. It's tremendously exciting, but they're not very useful yet because you still have to manually update them. Um, the infrastructure is in place, however, and I'm sure that in the future this will be transparent and beautiful and wonderful, but in the meantime, this is a major step forward towards that. Again, JSON functions, you can now dereference into a JSON object. You can create functional indexes on it without needing to rely on something like PLV8 for a, a you know, query language. Uh, this is a big step forward from the last release where we had a JSON data type, but really it was just, you know, you could declare your column as JSON and it would just validate that you had JSON in the column. Uh, so it's a big, Big step in the right direction. Again, foreign tables have gained writability in 9.3. This is huge. This makes Postgres, someone described Postgres's future as being you know, potentially a data broker. Postgres sits at the center, routing all the data through places, distributing queries out to all the edges of your, your sort of data graph. One of the most striking changes I've seen at Heroku in the time that I've been working in the database space is that people don't so much choose one database anymore they choose a variety of databases for their uh, needs. So for example, Andrew Dunstan was talking about pairing uh, Redis with Postgres. I see people combining um, Amazon's DynamoDB with Postgres. We see people just sort of pulling all the pieces today. The SF Pug uh, just last week had an engineer from Stripe, which is a payments company that runs everything through Mongo for some reason, come in and talk about how they built a pipeline from Mongo into Postgres which allows their analytics people to have the power and flexibility of Postgres just pulled in via a combination of PLV8 and, and various other components. Uh, also, 9.3 gets regular expression indexing, which is just so cool, I, I had to, to call it out. That's, that's a really exciting thing. So if you want to talk kind of at a high level, uh, what was the 9 series all about? It was about read scaling, being able to do more uh, scale in your database. It's about extensibility. And we really see the database community start to embrace this creativity and begin to say not, you know, what does the standard say or how are we going to catch up, but what can we do? Where do we want to take this thing? What's next? And this is, for me, enormously exciting. I can't, I can't wait to see where this goes. So uh, wait, you're probably saying. Uh, can you oversimplify this even more? <laughs> <laughs> Having digested uh, 15 years of uh, databases into 15 minutes? Yes, I can. Uh, Postgres 7, I think, was really all about foundations and durability. It was about just getting a database that worked. You know, 
Uh, Postgres 8 series was all about adding functionality and performance. This is where that slogan, the world's most advanced open source database, I think really became an accurate description. Uh, and Postgres 9 has been about replication and extensibility. Uh, what will Postgres 10 be about? I hope you went to some talks, um, but I'm going to sort of give my uh, assessment of what I would expect. I think we're going to see a huge explosion in community extensibility. Uh, PGXN is an amazing project because it's, as it grows and matures, it's going to make it possible for this new extension work to be available to everybody. Uh, I think we're going to see massive scalability. The logical replication work, which today just missed 9.3, which is too bad. And in 9.4, when it lands, I'm sure people will look at it and go, ah, this doesn't quite meet my needs. But just wait, it will. This is, this is the way that Postgres community works. One, you know, you take sure steps forward, one at a time, inevitably towards something incredible. Uh, and I think visibility is, is increasingly a thing that we're seeing, PG stat statements. Um, I think an area where Postgres is really weak, and it has been weak because Visibility is not much of a priority until, thanks, Craig. I don't, I don't know how to turn that off. Please nobody tweet at me. Uh, I mean, I can turn off my Wi-Fi. <laughs> All right, this, <laughs> that was a mistake. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> I, I think that uh, visibility becomes increasingly important as uh, more and more uh, Postgres installations get out there, which are operated by application developers and end users, as opposed to uh, having the support of a really skilled DBA. And even visibility in the hands of a skilled DBA is so much more powerful when you have good tools. Uh, a great example of this would be the uh, 9.2 extensions to PG stat statements, which allow you to actually see, for example, by query, you know, which queries are consuming the most time in my database and are consuming the most I.O. across, you know, how many times has this query been run? And that's, that's a window into your database that was basically impossible to get before. So this is really a remarkable improvement. I think we'll continue to see that, that expanding. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about how we got there, which is sort of this, this shift from taking this, you know, young open source project building a good foundation, and then now sort of open, opening the doors to new kinds of development and new ways to go forward. I want to talk a little bit about marketing, because if there's one thing that the competition has been better at than Postgres, it's this. Uh, so I'm going to start by saying a few words about adoption and why you should care, even though it works fine for you. So, well, OK, I'm, I'm taking this as granted. You are using Postgres, right? Right? OK, good. So maybe you're also building Postgres. That's, that's definitely a thing. Uh, but the people who build Postgres use Postgres. So companies that run Postgres invest in it. And if you have no users, then there are no developers. And if you don't have any developers, then there aren't any patches. And if you don't have any patches, no Postgres. So there's a, there's a chain from getting people into Postgres, from expanding the community, from focusing on adoption, that leads to a better Postgres. Uh, but it's not always easy to deal with the noobs, I know. So let's talk about marketing for open source, which is really, uh, how can we raise awareness without spending money? Um, because we are, we are an open source community. And fortunately, people will do this for us. Uh, and they do this in a way that I'm going to describe using a marketing term called the funnel. How many people know what a funnel is or what it means? Just OK, wow, this is good. I'll explain it. I am going to come over there. And... Real time. <laughs> I'm sure this will work. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So the, fu <laughs> the funnel. <laughs> so the funnel is a marketing term which describes uh, basically the process whereby uh, somebody goes from some initial state to, uh, in traditional terms, a sale. Uh, and in the context of an open source community, what we're really talking about is uh, what are the steps that it takes for a person to go from never hearing about Postgres 
to coming to PGCon, to being a contributor, to being a developer in the project, and how can we understand those steps, and how do we focus on improving them? And there are certain places in this process I think that the Postgres community does amazingly well, and there are certain areas that I think uh, could use improvement. Uh, and, and the way that, the reason it's called a funnel is because you think about it as basically, you know, at each step, if you've never heard about Postgres, you're not going to install it. Once you install Postgres, a certain number of people are going to get confused and give up before they use it. If you start using it, you're going to get scared, or you're going to get confused, or you're going to get frustrated, and then you're going to stop using it. And if you get into production, you're going to run into some problem you can't fix, and then you're going to move off. And so you end up with this shape that basically comes down. And the goal of what's called funnel optimization is to say, like, OK, can we expand the top? Can we get more people exposed to this? But also, it's not good if the people who you're exposing to what you're doing don't then take any action on it, right? Like, if, if everybody's heard about Postgres because it's that database that, like, you know, took down a building with some bug, then that's not good, uh, maybe. Unless you can somehow spin that to blame MySQL, I don't know. Um, so let's talk about, this is, this is what I would sort of describe the funnel as looking like for an open source project and an open source community. You begin with word of mouth. Have people heard of it? Then you have to get from having heard about it to installing it somewhere, to, to, a, to, to trying it. Once they get it, how are their first 15 minutes? How many times have you installed a piece of software and within 15 minutes you're like, nope. I guarantee you most of the software you try falls in that category. If they make it through that first 15 minutes, what do they do? What do they learn? What are the challenges that they come across? And then once they get from that into joining the community, will they stay? Are they going to you know, become advocates? Are they going to get out there and talk in the community? Or are they going to just kind of like fall out because they have some problem that they don't know how to solve or something else that's shiny comes along and, and drags them away? So word of mouth, let's talk about this. Postgres has a great reputation. What does it have a great reputation for? It is powerful, it is featureful, and if you type Postgres is very, or Postgres is really, or things like that into Google, a lot of people talk about how Postgres is slow. Postgres is not slow. Why do people think that? It's because other databases have basically differentiated themselves by being faster. Faster than what? Well, faster than Postgres. And this, this public perception lags a long way behind reality. You have to be out there and talk about these things. Um, but I actually don't think that the slowness of Postgres is really uh, a big deal in this day and age. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I, I don't think that the slowness is really a big liability in this day and age. I think uh, scalability is a much bigger liability uh, when I talk to people out there. Uh, let's talk about Mongo uh, instead. MongoDB is known for being performant. It's known for being easy to get started. And I wanted to include one sort of bad word here uh, to parallel the Postgres. It's also known for being unreliable. When I go out there and talk to people, a lot of the time I say, hey, what, what database do you use and why did you choose it? You know, what, what led you to it? And increasingly, I hear a ton of people say that they're using Mongo, especially in the Node.js community, which is one of the fastest growing communities uh, of software developers anywhere. And I think that you ignore that community at your own peril because the unification of uh, JavaScript from the client to the server side to the database is really a very powerful concept. And I think that uh, it seems to be getting a lot of traction right now. Uh, it's already, I think, uh, growing fairly. It's, it's definitely growing faster than languages like Python or Ruby. Uh, how far will that go? It's, it's impossible to predict. Um, and in the Node world, Mongo is king, which means that if Node becomes the next big language, then no one will ever try Postgres because they're just locked into this other community. I think that that's why this work around the JSON data type and PLV8 is so important. Um, it, it helps to raise awareness and get people to try Postgres. And in my experience, once people try Postgres, they tend to stick around. So what does installation look like? Uh, that's the next phase. There's Postgres.org. Of course, people get things through package managers, apt-get. Uh, what's that experience look like? 
how do we optimize that? You know, you do apt-get install uh, Postgres on Ubuntu, it's a great experience. If you're on Mac and you do uh, homebrew install Postgres, it's terrible. Next thing you know, you're like modifying kernel parameters and rebooting your system. Then if you do that wrong, your system starts, uh, I don't even know what you call a blue screen on, on Mac, but it does that. Um, <laughs> If you're on, uh, if you're using a service provider like uh, Heroku or Engine Yard or AWS, right? Amazon doesn't offer Postgres today, uh, which means that if you start by choosing your service provider and you plan then to use them to run your database, if you chose AWS first, that's the end, right? Like Postgres isn't even under consideration. So looking at these different areas where people are adopting databases and understanding how that fits into uh, you know, community success is. Uh... <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, people have to get Postgres from somewhere before they can do anything else. So let's look at Postgres.org. Um, in, in the spirit of being a marketing person for the day, is there a call to action on the Postgres site? What is it? Does it use good words to describe what the database is? What are those words that we want people to think about when they think about Postgres? Advanced, powerful, scalable. Flexible. What are, how many of those words will you see when you go to the home page? And then who's looking at the conversion rate and running experiments to try changing that page? I, I, I've talked actually to the web team, so I know the answer to that. Um, here's the screenshot from the home page from a couple of days ago. Um, the first thing you see is this blue thing that says PostgreSQL. I think it's actually really helpful to put it up on the projector like this because it, <laughs> it blurs the details somewhat, which is, you know, your eyes are drawn to particular things. You see, uh, you see a big elephant, that's good. You don't see the word database, right? Uh, it's actually here in about eight point letters, uh, as are those other good words, advanced and open source. Um, pardon? Nine point, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, maybe my, I shrunk the screen slightly. Um, you see that the beta is out, that's great. Is that the first thing we want people to see when they come to the Postgres page? It depends who you're targeting to. If we're as a community, if we're focused on getting existing people to run the beta, then this is a great choice. I don't know what the conversion rate on this is. Um, I don't know who, how you would, I don't know who would run this test, but the question is when a new user comes, are they grabbing the beta because that's the first link that says download? You know, when I go to a web page, a lot of the time I just come to a page and I see the big button that says download and I mash it because I know that I want the thing and the thing is there and then I read like three words and I click download. Right? Like, that's a great experience. Um, there's a lot of information here. You know, there's some good stuff, like a featured user. That's really cool. There's some quick links to latest releases. Which one of these do I want? Why? It's hard to say. Can we just have, like, a button that takes me to just the thing I need? Anyway, I, optimizing web pages is a whole uh, art and discipline unto itself. And it's an area that I think the open source community uh, would do well to build expertise in because it really helps to drive more people towards using your software. And as we know, more people using your software means, <laughs> means, hang on. <laughs> more people using your software means more people finding bugs means more people suggesting features, means more people getting into the developer community, means more patches, means more Postgres. So it's really important not to neglect this part of the process. Um, why are people choosing Postgres? This is another good question to understand. Um, you know, what do developer surveys say? Are they choosing them because they hear about things like HStore or PostGIS that they can't get anywhere else? Are they doing it because it's a framework or provider default? Heroku has really shifted the Ruby community towards Postgres because we had the fortunate accident of choosing Postgres when we didn't think it mattered which one we chose, and this one sounded easier to operate. Uh, the Django community uh, recommends Postgres first in their list of databases. Jacob Kaplan Moss has said, the founder of the Django project, has said that if he had his way, 
He wouldn't even support any other databases. Uh, that's a big deal. Building bridges to those communities is a great way to get more adoption. Listen to them. Ask them questions. What do they want? Where do they hurt? Um, you know, one channel that does drive people towards Postgres is, you know, when they have a bad experience with another database, they go and they look, where should I go? Um, I had a conversation with uh, a consultancy called Pivotal, which is well known in the, the Ruby world. They said generally the first thing they do when they meet a client with a Mongo database is they port them over to Postgres. That's their first process. Um, the, another good thing to look at, and the problem is we don't have data about a lot of this stuff, or at least I couldn't find it. Uh, who's choosing Postgres? In, in Python and Ruby, I actually am reasonably confident from the data I've seen that Postgres is the preferred choice. Uh, what about with PHP and Java developers? What about Node.js? What are the languages of the future? Where are the areas that are growing? And can we be the default there? Because if you, you, know, uh, if you have a seat on a rocket ship, you're going to go places. OK. Uh, talking again about the first 15 minutes, uh, the MySQL guys were really uh, the best at this. MongoDB has completely copied their playbook. And this is all about the time to first aha. Uh, where you really get why this is a big deal and why you should be excited. There are ways to help there that we could do. There's low-hanging fruit. And Postgres is making big strides here. I, I want to actually especially thank Robert for committing the System 5 shared memory patch for 9.3. Uh, that means that from now on, new users trying Postgres for the first time, the first thing they do isn't go edit some bizarre uh, system kernel control config and then reboot their computer. That is awesome. Uh, also, this the, that kernel parameter configuration, right? It led to all kinds of problems down the road, which were mysterious and difficult to debug, despite the many great efforts of people like Dave Page to uh, streamline that. Now it's no longer a problem. Um, once they get on board, how do people learn about Postgres? How many people have used the Postgres tutorial to learn Postgres? Uh, four or five of you. That's it. Um, and how many of you did that in the last decade? <laughs> Zero. Uh, so how then do people learn about the features Postgres has? I like to talk about the stuff that's sort of got some flash to it, like HStore or JSON. But even just like the stuff that is now taken for granted, how do people learn about good ways to use foreign keys? How do people learn about how to do things that are you know, really, really painful if you don't know they exist? But how would you ever find out, like save points? Uh, if you're using psql and you don't have backslash x space auto in your .psqlrc file, which you probably also didn't know existed, there's this great feature which automatically reformats the output of queries to be you know, wide or tall depending on what comes back from the database. But how would you ever know that that was even an option? Right? How do you make these things visible? How do you make them discoverable? I'm told by many users that the output from backslash uh, h or back, yeah, backslash h, which lists all those commands in psql, terrifies them. They don't know what 90% of those things are. They're just like, oh, what do I do? Why, why is backslash d plus not the default? Right? Like, these are important. These are things that if you use Postgres every day, you forget. You sit down with new users, you talk to new users, and they just have no idea what's going on. When people have problems, how do they solve them? I know they come to IRC. There's only one Rhodium toad. Uh, as the community continues to grow, he's not going to be able to answer everybody's questions. <coughs> so how do users solve problems? How do they go to production? What does the productionalization checklist look like? Is there a checklist a user can say they've got, I've got Postgres, I want to launch, what do I need to do? Can we put that on postgres.org? Can someone like, put, print out a thing that someone can go down the checklist and it says, like, make sure that this is set, make sure that that is set. I've sat in lots of great talks at conferences that talk about this. I don't know of a good canonical place to send people who ask me that. Um, and of course, one thing people ask a lot is, does it scale? Uh, and maybe that's the does it blend of our time. So once they get through all this, once they've managed to hear about Postgres, if they heard good things, once they manage to install it, if they've managed to get their hands on it, once they manage to figure out how to use it, once they manage to put it in production, are they going to stay? 
Yes, I think so. Postgres is pretty good. So let's talk about pain points and existential threats. This is sort of two categories of areas that you can improve uh, Postgres and help it go forward, um, which have different kind of time horizons and also different kind of, uh, I'm just gonna leave it alone, different, different kind of uh, characteristics. So a pain point, I'll give you some examples of some, Bad query plans can really ruin your day. Uh, new users getting frustrated by things like kernel parameters can really turn people off. Um, upsert is just kind of a no-brainer that we should do at some point. Materialized views, people come from other databases and they're like, really, we don't have that? Um, but these things affect adoption and they affect attrition, but what they are not likely to do by fixing is really change the game in terms of you know, what is the scale of the addressable market for Postgres as a software project. You know, uh, on the other hand, what's an existential threat? Uh, I'm pretty sure the code is well mirrored. Postgres isn't going away. When I say existential threat, what I really mean is, is there a future where smart developers with interesting problems should probably choose something else? Do smart developers with interesting problems, are they, is the right choice not to use Postgres? Right now, I think that in most cases, for many, many use cases, possibly the majority of use cases, the right tool for the job is Postgres. That's a really, really cool place to be. But the world is changing, right? And if you focus only on solving pain points and you know, optimizing that experience, eventually you get bypassed. So what are the kinds of things that could lead to, oh, COBOL is an example, right? You, you stand still long enough and the world moves on. People write COBOL today, but nobody, no smart developers with interesting problems are better off choosing COBOL for their projects. Uh, so the kinds of things I talk about when I say that is, what if the way that people build software changes? What if people, you know, the relational model is beautiful. Uh, it's obscured by SQL to the point of almost unrecognizability, but underlying that, there's this beautiful set theoretic manipulation which has wonderful properties. Uh, but if the world switches to thinking in documents, if the world switches to thinking uh, in graphs, if, if people stop trusting in databases because they fundamentally can, are found not to scale well, right, it's, it's very expensive to maintain consistency on large data sets. And by large, I don't mean a gigabyte, I mean a petabyte, right? I don't know that there are consistent databases at that scale that do significant transactional velocity and maintain total, you know, referential consistency. Uh, and so what happens is people say, well, I can't use a database. I'm going to have to implement this stuff in application land. And they learn to deal with the problems elsewhere because they have these needs that can't be met. You know, th th this, is, this is data overload is a, is a real existential threat to this project, right? Data sets are getting bigger. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that the use cases that are out there today are going to go away. People will use Postgres for 50 years. I have no doubt in my mind. My point is that uh, will they be using it to maintain their legacy systems you know, in an emulator, or will they be building new amazing things on it? Uh, it comes down to whether or not the kinds of challenges that are arising in this space are, are risen to and met by the project. And I talk about you know, the Postgres petabyte project. You know, how, do we, how do we get the first unmodified cluster with a petabyte of data usefully in it? What does that look like? There's a long road to get there. It's going to take years. You know, what do you, when we talk about massive throughput, what does it look like to have a cluster that would serve Facebook? Right? And, and as an aside, Facebook is really interesting because Facebook is on MySQL. And Facebook's not on MySQL because it was the right choice. Facebook is on the MySQL because Mark Zuckerberg, in those first 15 minutes, found the database that worked for him, and they never reached something that they couldn't solve along the way. So uh, here are some ways you can help make Postgres grow. Tom, I think you've already got this covered. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, study the new users. They have extremely valuable ignorance. If you're in this room, you probably are blind to most of the problems. Go sit down next to someone who's using Postgres for the first time and take notes. Where does it hurt? <laughs> Get out there in the community and give exciting talks. There is an enormous amount of really cool stuff in Postgres that people don't know about it. And whether it's traditional, like, uh, traditional is the wrong word, whether it is uh, standard compliant, 
like relational algebra, amazing like window functions and that kind of thing that is just like the bread and butter of the relational database's strong area. People don't know you can do that. Or whether it's the crazy out there like, oh my god, you're you know, using a foreign data wrapper around a Twitter account. Th these things excite people when you get out there and talk about it. It makes people reconsider what it means to use a database. It makes people rethink what they're doing. Uh, so when you get out there and talk about foreign data wrappers, and not here, right? People here are already listening. Go out there to a node.js conference and give a talk on things that they will be interested in. Talk about PLV. Go out to a Python conference and don't just talk about PL Python. Talk about just amazing ways that Django could better leverage the database. Get on the Django mailing list and you know, submit a patch for uh, you know, advanced Postgres functionality that's not well supported today. Introductory user content. People ask me all the time, where do I go to learn about using Postgres? They, they've got a service provider like Enterprise DB or Heroku, or they've got a sysadmin who you know, can, can run Postgres for them. What they want to know is, like, how would you find out about PGStat statements? How would you find out about PGStat activity? How do you learn about when to use a GIN or a GIST index? This stuff is not super well documented. It's there in reference form. The Postgres manual is amazing if you know a thing exists. How do you learn what's possible? Uh, get out there and write some data types. There is so much low-hanging fruit here. Why is there no URL type? I want to make an index on host name. Right? I've got refers coming. I want to find all the ones who are referred from Google.com. I can do this with crazy regular expression magic, but like, URL is not yet implemented. This is, this is non-trivial. URLs can be tricky. But these kinds of problems, right? Like it's not like all the easy stuff is gone. It's not like you have to implement you know, like crazy, obscure physics things to even find something to work on or tweets as a data type. Or, there's just easy stuff to do. Why is there no uh, SI units uh, data type, which you know, makes sure that I'm not accidentally adding meters and pounds? You know? Why is, there no, no, why is there no data type that works like a range type and wraps another type and makes sure that I'm not converting you know, miles per hour and kilometers per hour and multiplying those together and getting something bad and then crashing my rover into the surface of Mars? You know, if, we, if we give people this kind of functionality and then we tell them about it, they'll use it. Uh, this one is, is another kind of like hilarious embarrassment, I think. There's no sample database out there. There's, there's no thing that everybody refers to that like, shows all the basic kind of features and functionality of Postgres that go above and beyond kind of like the MySQL stuff. And really embarrassingly, the only thing that even comes close to that is a port of the MySQL one. I see so many talks where people refer to like the regression test databases or the PG Bench databases. Like this, this is. It's not the easiest thing, or someone would have done it right now. But you don't have to be a database hacker to help out here. You know, make a GitHub repo, tweet about it, get some other people on board. It's fun. Uh, and so my, my other request is if you, if you are Tom Lane, or if you are Dimitri, or if you are you know, any one of a million other people in this room uh, who are probably judging me now, uh, I ask that you continue to design for simplicity. Uh, and I will say that if, if using the feature that you're proposing requires understanding database internals, you lost. There are so many users out there who will never be able to approach your, the, who will never be able to take advantage of what you build if it requires understanding things about buffer caches and everything else. As a counterexample, I think Toast is a great demonstration of a, a case where if you architect something well, it just becomes part of people's workflow, and it imposes no cognitive load on them. They can just take advantage of it for the rest of their lives. It's a big deal. So let me wrap this up, because I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk. Um, Postgres has been successful not because of MySQL failing, though it certainly didn't hurt. Postgres's success comes from solving real user problems. Uh, and I think that the greater success Postgres has seen later is because, or recently, is because it's starting to solve problems that don't just apply to 
a few users, but apply to a lot of users. If you're thinking about problems to solve, look for things that will help a lot of people a bit, because that can be just as important as helping a few people a lot. There are some great things that we have behind us already. Postgres is stable. Postgres has replication. The data types and extensions are really like, phenomenal, and, and I think that we're going to see a huge explosion thanks to the work of a number of people in this room. PG upgrade is a game changer. Uh, and there are many great things ahead of us. We're going to see extensibility continue to grow. I'm hearing stories about pluggable storage engines, pluggable parsers, pluggable executors. And once this stuff gets opened up, man, it's going to be a pain to maintain those APIs. But when someone in the community can say, like, I just I need to calculate statistics differently for this use case that I have, and I don't want to wait. Uh, what was it? My stove is on fire. I don't want to wait until the new release of the stove comes out, the new model. Uh, when people can solve those problems for themselves, then people can start to talk in code. People can adopt things ahead of the curve. And those great things that are out there getting field tested in the real world, when they're really valuable, we can fold them into the project. And if they're just applicable to a niche use case, now they don't need to be. Now you don't have that, well, how many people does this uh, help problem? It's, hey. You know, this is a great extension. You can use it when you have that. Uh, replication, replication, replication. Uh, this is, I think, a lot of the like, hardest engineering that's going to go into the next releases, or the next series of releases is going to be around building out you know, bidirectional replication, multi-master replication, all these different terms for this stuff, but going beyond what's capable with one node, addressing the limitations of having one single spinning uh, magnet uh, that holds all of your business's most precious data, and where the limitation on how fast you can write is just how fast that magnet is whipping around inside a little box. Uh, new data types, I think we're going to see a lot of really exciting things start to come up here now that the infrastructure is in place. And I think we're going to see a lot of really cool new extensions. The future is going to be awesome. Or it will be, if you make it. Thanks very much. <laughs>